Okay, I. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. I know we'll have uh, people coming in uh, possibly while we, as we begin, but that's okay. Um, I just wanna welcome everybody to the first Great Mind Salon of the year. Uh, hopefully there, we will be having a few more. I um, am Ellen Pristak. I've, this is my third season doing this. And I just want to say welcome. I'm uh, thrilled to have Leah as our presenter, although I'm not sure we seem to. All right, so I need to make her hold on. Technical issues need to make her a co-host again. Sorry, everyone. I seem to be having some kind of internet troubles. So we're going to try again. Ellen, I'm admitting people. So you can okay. do the other stuff. Okay. Okay. It still says screen share disabled. Can you make her a co host? I did. So it looks like I'm not co host again anymore because right, I had to, I dropped out again. and I had to come back okay. in. All right. I'll make you a co host again. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Not a problem. Okay, you should be now. Okay, great. Um, okay, so okay, I, think good. I think it's working this time. All right, I'm so sorry. Okay. That's okay. Techn technology is great when it works, but you know, we always, so I'm going to go back to welcoming everybody. I'm excited for our uh, Great Mind Salon season and very excited to have Leah Bustan as our first guest. Um, as you know, I like to claim when I have uh, children as my students, so I'm lucky enough to have had and still have uh, all three of Leah's uh, and Renan's children, and they're a pleasure. And I know we're all looking forward to this very important and timely and relevant subject. So I'll tell you a little bit about Leah and then I will turn it over to her. And as I said, please stay muted and at the end you can put questions in the chat. Leah Bustan is a professor of economics at Princeton University where she also serves as the director of the industrial relations section. Professor Bustan is also the co-director of the Department of the American Economy Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Her new book, Streets of Gold, America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success, compares immigration in the United States during the Ellis Island era, a century ago, with immigration today. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Leah. Thank you so much, Ellen. I'm really honored to be here with all of you tonight. I have had the chance to talk about this book quite a bit over the past few months since it came out in May. but. It comes from the bottom of my heart to say that speaking about it here in my own community with all of you tonight has been my favorite talk uh, for this whole season. Um, so this is a book with my longtime research collaborator, Ron Abramitsky, who is at Stanford. And we were inspired to move beyond just writing academic articles to writing a book for the public because we felt like the national conversation about immigration and immigration policy is too often driven by anecdotes and myths rather than by data and facts. Um, and so one of these myths inspired our title, the idea of streets of gold, that America is a place where anyone can come with just a few dollars in their pocket and they can quickly move up the ladder and make it here. 
Um, but we wanted to turn to the data and perhaps the reality is a lot more complex. In fact, if any of you have gone to the Ellis Island Museum, you will find there painted on the wall this quotation, which is attributed to an unnamed Italian immigrant. And he said, I came to America because I heard that the streets were paved with gold. When I got here, I found out three things. First, the streets were not paved with gold. Second, they weren't paved at all. And third, I was expected to pave them. So what we wanted to know is how our understanding of America's immigration history would change if we turned to the millions of unnamed immigrants that have contributed to the country rather than to those very famous immigrants who make it to the front pages of the newspaper. And that could be on the positive side, it could be CEOs or inventors, or it could be on the negative side, um, famous criminals who are from immigrant heritage. So what would our story look like if we were able to use data on millions of immigrant families? And so we have done this for the Ellis Island era, as Ellen mentioned, by going back to historical census records. And those have been digitized mostly by volunteers from the Church of Latter-day Saints, from the Mormon Church. Um, and we have come up with computer algorithms to follow individuals across census waves over time. So we can see an immigrant when he first lands in the country and then follow him 10 years later and 10 years after that. We also can follow his children who we see living at home on the census page to when they uh, become adults. In the modern period, we are using data from the IRS records for when we all file taxes. And we can see um, children living at home with their parents who are recorded as tax dependents. And we see their social security number when they're children, and then they can be followed into the labor market. Of course, the modern IRS data is absolutely under lock and key. We don't have access to any individual data, but I can show you um, some of the aggregate patterns that the IRS um, was able to make for us uh, for the purposes of this book. Um, so um, I just wanted to acknowledge that around three years ago, just as we were embarking on writing the book, um, I gave a Great Mind Salon in January 2020. Um, and that was really uh, the very first month that we sat down to write the book. Um, and now it's almost three years later. Um, and so uh, one of you who will go unnamed asked me at uh, Shabbat Services this week, so what's gonna be different about your Great Mind Salon uh, compared to the Great Mind Salon that you gave three years ago? Um, and so um, I am going to very briefly um, show you uh, some of the patterns that we uncover and talk about in the book. But I do want to spend most of my time um, on what's new, um, on some new findings that we think speak to the current political moment. Um, and since the Great Mind Salon um, three years ago, the book has come out. It is now available. Um, and um, we had a, the great fortune of having a number of um, press articles written about it. Um, so this was from the Washington Post, um, what the research really says about American immigration. Um, and this was in the New York Times, why so many children of immigrants rise to the top. Um, and then this was recently in Vox.com with a, I don't think very accurate, but maybe um, a <laughs> caricature of me um, in what they call the future perfect 50. So 50 academics who are working towards um, a more perfect world. Uh, so what does the research really say about American immigration? Um, and so let me um, spend five minutes or so just kind of summarizing some of the new findings in the book. What do we learn when we turn to the data? Um, and then I want to end with um, some uh, new findings that speak to the political moment that we find ourselves in now. So when um, you, uh, do um, pick up your copy of the book, you'll find that we um, reassess four immigration myths and we end up busting a number of those commonly held uh, misperceptions. So we ask, is it really true that there is an unprecedented flood of immigration today? Have we never been in a situation before in American history where we have as many immigrants in the country as we have now? 
Um, and you'll see that the answer is no. The Ellis Island era, of course, was an era where we had just as many immigrants as a share of the population as we do now, one in seven residents of the population. Is it really true that the Ellis Island immigrants uh, who moved to the country 100 years ago moved very quickly up the ladder from rags to riches, but immigrants today are not as successful? Um, and the answer to that is also no. The immigrant generation themselves always were slow to move up the ladder, both for my uh, great grandparents' generation and for immigrants today. Um, are immigrant families and their children stuck in a permanent underclass? Immigrants these days do come from all over the world, including many very poor countries. Are their children unable to rise? And the answer is no. And um, is it true that immigrants do not make efforts to become culturally American, especially now compared to the past? And again, the answer is no. Um, so I will touch on a few of these myths briefly, um, but then I wanna ask, given that I'll be painting a very optimistic picture, um, which will show you that the American dream is just as real now as it was 100 years ago, why is it so hard to pass immigration reform? What are the political barriers that we face today and what can the data say about that? Okay, so turning to myth number one, is it really true that we are in the midst of an immigration flood today? What we're looking at here is a graphic that the New York Times made, so it's really beautiful, um, about using our underlying data. Um, and what you can see is the share of the US population that were born abroad. Starting in 1850, all the way on the left-hand side of your screen, um, which is the first year that the census asked everyone about their place of birth, uh, going all the way up to today. And so today, around 15% of the population is foreign born. And everyone who's alive today grew up in an era when the share foreign born was lower than it is now. So from all of our perspectives, thinking back to childhood, sure, there are more immigrants now than when we were kids. I was a kid right here. Um, but if you go even further back in time, of course, the Ellis Island period is one with very similar rates of migration. Um, and again, 15% of the population foreign born. But another thing you can see from this image is where in the world immigrants come from. The yellow part of the picture represents Europe. Many of our ancestors came to the US in this early wave of mass migration, mine did, and they came from a European country in many cases. Um, and so in that situation, you would reflect the average for the Ellis Island period. During that time, 90% of immigrants came from a European country. But look at the diversity of immigrants today represented by the varying colors. You can see red reflecting the Americas and blue reflecting Asia. So immigrants today come from a much more diverse set of countries a poorer set of countries relative to the US. And so there's really no reason to believe that immigrants today and their children are necessarily gonna move up the ladder as at the same pace now as, it, as they did then, which is why it was quite interesting and quite surprising to us when we found out in the data that in fact they do. So we started by looking at the historical census data to determine the facts for the past. Um, and I'll just show you one um, not selected at random uh, image of a census manuscript um, to give you a, a sense of um, the underlying historical data that we use. This might look familiar to you if anyone has gone to ancestry.com to look up their own relatives. I, I did, and unfortunately on Zoom, I can't see all of you now, but you know, you can raise your hand if you also have done that. Usually when I speak to people, like a good half of the people in the room raise their hand and say, yes, I've done the same. And so you know that, oh, and I see some hands are going up on Zoom, great. So you know you type in the name and you can find possible matches for your relatives. And that is how we started our research project over 10 years ago was literally going to ancestry.com and typing in some names. And then we started to get a little bit greedy. What would happen if we typed in thousands of names or 
more names than it's possible for us to type in with a human hand. What would happen if we automated that process? Eventually, the ancestry lawyers called my co-author, Ron, at Stanford and left a message. And when he called them back, they said, Mr. Abramitsky, it looks like you have a very big family. So they thought we were actually trying to steal the data. When they found out that we were academics, they let us finish the project. And now they have a research partnership with us and with people like us in the academy. So we have access to the underlying data, which allows us to match these folks over time. Now, who is this person here? Hyman Platt is my great grandfather, living in Chicago in 1920 with his eight kids and his wife, Annie. And if you scroll over on the page, you can see his occupation and his children's occupations. Um, some of his kids are too young to be working yet. For those folks, we can follow them to later census periods. And what we find is that my family reflects the larger pattern that we see in the data historically and today, which is that the first generation, the immigrants themselves are slow to move up the ladder. And the second generation is the generation that rises. So let me show you in two pictures what I mean by the second generation, uh, the children of immigrants rising and experiencing upward mobility at a really um, you know, very inspiring and startling pace. And I will do that for the modern period and then circle back around to compare that to Ellis Island period. So I'm going to select a group of kids who were raised um, with working poor uh, parents, kids who were raised at the 25th percentile of the income distribution, meaning that they had two parents who were working full time for mi minimum wage or something to that effect. That's how you can think of the 25th percentile. What happens to those kids when they grow up? So this picture shows the modern data that comes from the IRS records. Let's start, because there's a lot of dots here, with the purple dot that's all the way over on the left-hand side of your screen, that reflects the children of white US-born parents. So these are the children whose parents are native, that are not immigrants. And you can see that they are moving up relative to where they were raised up to the 46th percentile. So they were raised at the 25th and they're getting almost all the way to the median. But take a look at all of these peach colored dots that are to the right of the white US born dot. These children are also all born in the United States, but they are born to families where the parents were born abroad and the parents were born in many different countries. This is the set of countries that the IRS was willing to give us just based on they felt like there was enough data underlying each one of these dots that it was not going to reveal any personal information. And so you can see that for almost every sending country in the world, children of immigrants who were raised at the 25th percentile are reaching a higher point when they get to adulthood than children of white US born parents. Um, and this is true even of countries like Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua that I put into this box, um, those kids are reaching around the 53rd percentile when they grow up if they were raised in a, a, a household at the 25th. And these countries I put in the box because these are the countries we've been hearing about most recently um, in terms of uh, the crisis at the southern border, so to speak. And so while their parents may not earn much, um, they may have manual jobs, they may work in construction or agriculture or um, in child or elder care or in restaurant work, the children are moving up. And now let me compare that to the historical data. So um, again, whether you're talking about kids who are already living in the US in 1880 or kids who are living in the US in 1910, and the right-hand picture is gonna reflect more Jewish families because 1880 is quite early. You can see that um, the children of white US born parents are again, shifted almost all the way over to the left. So they are moving up relative to their parents, but they're not moving up as rapidly as children of a whole variety um, of countries from Europe, including 
the Italians, the Irish, the Portuguese, and the Russians. And we've since separated the Russians into Russian Jews and Russian non-Jews. Um, and so many of these Russians, around 70% of them or, or so are Jewish. Um, these are groups that were pointed to by politicians at the time to say, these are groups that are never going to assimilate. They won't contribute much. Um, they are remaining in poverty, but yet we see their children were rising. Um, okay, um, so I now want to turn to the second part of um, what I hope that we talk about, um, which is if we have this optimistic and hopeful news um, that the American dream is just as real now as it was 100 years ago, why has it been so hard to pass immigration reform? And this puzzle deepens when you turn to the public opinion polling. The latest Gallup poll suggests that 75% of Americans say that immigration is good for the country. And I'll show you that it deepens further if you go, if you are able to extend data on attitudes towards immigration further back than you can do with survey data. Survey data will only take you so far. Um, but we have compiled new data from the congressional record of all of the speeches that have been given on the floor of the House or Senate about immigration. And what we find is that the average speech is more positive now than at any point in US history. And the reason why is not because um, that uh, you know every politician is pro-immigration. Of course, we know there's a number that are anti-immigration. Um, but we, what you'll see is that we've always had anti-immigration politicians and anti-immigration electorates in some parts of the country. But what's different now is that we actually have a, a large group of pro-immigration politicians and pro-immigration electorate really for um, uh, the first time in, in, in recent years. But of course, what's going on is that there's real polarization now. Um, and so it's really vital to understand what is driving uh, these divisions. So how do we go as far back as 1870 in the data to look at political attitudes towards immigration when we don't have surveys? No one can go back in a time machine to ask people about their views. Um, what we did was we went to the congressional record and every speech is recorded in full text. There's 8 million such speeches. First, we had to find the immigration related speeches, and we do that by classifying a set of speeches as immigration related or not by hand, and then scaling up that classification using machine learning techniques so that we can apply what we've learned from reading a subset of speeches, maybe 5,000 speeches, up to the full data set. And the computer will help us determine which words reveal whether a speech is immigration related or not. And we found 200,000 speeches. And then we use the same type of technique to classify those speeches as either pro, neutral, or anti-immigration. And here's what we found. So we go all the way back to 1880 and all the way forward to today. And we're looking at the difference between the share of speeches that are pro-immigration versus the share that are anti-immigration. When this number is negative, it means that more of the speeches that were given on the floor of Congress that year are against immigrants. And that number is negative and very strongly negative from 1880 all the way forward until 1950. And that's true for both parties. The two parties are lying right on top of each other, the blue Democrats and the red Republicans. And then we start to see polarization um, opening up only in recent years. So before we get there, we see the transition from 1950 to 1965. There's a very interesting generation here after World War II when President Truman especially tried to change the narrative on whether immigration was good or bad for the country. And he regularly said that immigrants fought patriotically alongside US-born Americans in World War II fighting fascism. 
and that immigrants contributed to building the country and building our cities and our industry. And by virtue of, for the first time, really having a positive set of associations with immigrants, the narrative in, the, at least in the halls of Congress, changed between 1950 and 65. From that point onward, the polarization that we now know started and widened so that in the recent years, we've never been more polarized um, than in the year 2020. But we've also really never been more positive on average about immigration. So we have a real opportunity here in recent years where we actually have champions of immigration, um, but we also have a real conundrum. How are we going to resolve the polarization that we now face? Um, so I just thought it would be kind of interesting to give you an example of the types of anti-immigrant speeches um, that you would have heard during this long era of anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, here is Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, who is a champion of border closure saying immigrants are from races most alien to the body of the American people and from the lowest and most illiterate classes of these races. So these are, this is the kind of speech that you heard regularly before 1950. And of course, we're very familiar with recent anti-immigrant speeches, um, including um, this quotation from the original uh, campaign of, um, but of then candidate Trump in 2015 saying assimilation has been very hard. It's almost, I won't say non-existent, but it gets to be pretty close. What was distinctive about candidate Trump was how jarring that anti-immigrant sentiment sounded to us and how distinct it was from the kinds of messages that we would more regularly hear. Um, so uh, the pre President Trump, when we classified his speeches was actually below the Republican Party, so even more anti-immigration than the Republican Party. Um, but of course, we also hear a wide range of pro-immigrant messages today. So when we um, dive more deeply into the data, we try to understand what are the topics that are driving this partisanship. And I'll just point your attention to the right-hand picture here. Um, these are 14 different topics that pop up regularly in speeches about immigration. Many of them will sound familiar to you. Um, you'll often hear, for example, President Trump talk about how immigrants bring crime. Um, there's also concerns about immigrants. Um, are they legal or illegal in the country? Um, do they create national security threats? And so on. So this is the set of topics that are under consideration in immigration-related speeches. And we organize them from um, topics that are most commonly found in Republican speeches in the red dots to those most commonly found in um, the speeches about immigration given by Democrats. And what we found in doing this really surprised me. I'm an economist, so I typically hear people talking about do immigrants steal jobs, which would be in this category labor, are, are immigrants a fiscal burden? Do they take more resources than they provide in taxes? Labor and economic issues were not differentially discussed by Democrats or Republicans. They did not contribute to the partisan gap in topics. Instead, what really popped out is that Republicans are more likely to reference crime when talking about immigration and Democrats are more likely to refer reference persecution, refugees, and immigrants as victims, which we uh, classify here in this victim category. Um, so if you, another way of thinking about it, Republicans are more likely to think of immigrants as potentially harming us through crime, and Democrats are more likely to think about how we can help immigrants um, and how immigrants are being harmed out there in the world and that we are a beacon of opportunity to help. So in a way, uh, this pattern made us think, made me and Ron think, for the research we're doing going forward, maybe we need to spend a little bit less time 
thinking about labor and economic issues, and instead really try to understand what does the data tell us about crime on the one hand and victim uh, type narratives on the other. So I'll end with that um, and uh, just show you uh, one slide um, on a new project that we're working on, on immigration and incarceration over the whole time period that we've been discussing. And then a slide or two um, on a new project on refugees. And this is what we found. And this was really, really startling to us. There has never been an era in US history when immigrants were more likely than white US born residents to be incarcerated. So the arguments of immigrants, they bring crime is absolutely contradicted by the data. So what I'm showing you here is just raw data from the census. And in the census, a census taker will come to your home and record you with your household members, or these days we'll send a survey to your house. But what if you're living in what's called group quarters, if you're living in a college dorm or an old age home or a prison or a jail, then they will classify you as living in a correctional facility. And so that is how we're able to go all the way back to 1870 and compare the incarceration rate of immigrants and white US born. And what's interesting is during the Ellis Island era, the two lines are lying right on top of each other. And then in recent years, with the rise of mass incarceration, that rise has hit US born residents more than immigrants. And so a gap has opened up and you see the blue line above the orange, meaning that white US born residents are more likely to be in prison than are immigrants. And so we then broke it down by different countries of origin. Um, and what we found is that this pattern is true for all country groups. For example, in the past, Northern and Western Europeans and Southern and Eastern Europeans don't look different, even though at the time there were the Trumps of the era pointing to Southern and Eastern Europeans and saying that they bring crime, gangs, um, drunkenness, and so on. Um, and today um, it's true also of Asians as well as, and this is quite interesting, Mexican and Central Americans. Now, I put a little asterisk next to Mexicans and Central Americans because in the raw data, the two lines are pretty much lying on top of each other. But when you control for educational differences, the fact that Mexican and Central American immigrants are far more likely than the white US born population to be high school dropouts. It's actually the case that Mexican and Central American high school dropouts are vastly less likely to be incarcerated than our white US born high school dropouts. Um, so that's on the crime side. On the refugee side, um, we've been studying refugee assimilation historically. There are a number of modern studies already on refugees in the US showing that refugees assimilate faster than non-refugees. They might start out earning less, but they their earnings rise dramatically, their English language ability rises dramatically and so on. But there's a debate going on in social science. Is this because refugees get more government support? They often will be relocated and resettled by a nonprofit with some government funds. They might get access to English classes and they also have legal permanent residency. They have a refugee visa. Or is it because of the investments that refugees make themselves in their own skills. So we looked at the Ellis Island era because refugees during that era, and you may know because maybe some of your family was fleeing from a pogrom, they didn't get special assistance. They didn't get government checks. They didn't get government resettlement. So we turned to these oral histories of the Ellis Island immigrants. We have a little over a thousand of them. So to us, that seems like a really small data set because we're used to big data, but the richness and detail of this data is truly amazing. We were able to classify for all of these immigrants their stated reason for moving. Did they move because of persecution or did they move for economic opportunity? We we're also very importantly able to classify them all by religion. And so of course the Jewish population represented in this collection of oral histories were more likely to report fleeing persecution, but not all of them. Um, 
I know that my family moved just to try to find, you know, a few a few dollars um, uh, and find a way to support themselves. Uh, there's no sense in our family that they were leaving um, because of acute persecution. So in that sense, we're able to compare Jewish immigrants who say that they were fleeing persecution versus those who say they were coming for economic opportunity. And another amazing thing about this collection is that we have very detailed information about English ability. We have an hour of speech for each one of these immigrants recorded on tape so we can record their accent and also with detailed transcripts so we can classify their vocabulary and syntax. Um, and so um, the vocabulary measure is really pretty cool. Um, it turns out that every word in the English language has been classified as to when you tend to learn that word. So you learn the word mother or mom when you're one and a half or two years old, but you don't learn the word revolution until you're 12. And so these are two um, examples of refugee immigrants, both Jewish immigrants, um, and one of them is classified as having a vocabulary score around five and the other a vocabulary score around six. And this means that the average word that this immigrant here on the top um, would speak was a word that was learned on average at around age five. So he uses pretty simple words. He says, my father went away from the army. He was a soldier. He didn't want to stay there. He came over here. So he's using pretty simple ways of explaining how the family moved. Whereas the other um, immigrant um, says the revolution was brewing. Things were becoming very hectic. Um, I just heard my nine-year-old say hectic for the first time. And I, I had to laugh to myself because I knew that it was one of those words that we classify as being um, a more elevated word. And so each one of the words in these statements, and there's a, an hour worth of statements for each immigrant, is re receives a score. Um, and this score comes from work that linguists have done. Um, so the word my, for example, is on average learned at the age 2.7, according to this score whereas the word revolution at the age 10. And what we found is that immigrants who left Europe in response to war, violence, or persecution attained higher English proficiency than other immigrants from the same country of origin and religious group. So just like in the modern data, we're finding historically that refugees assimilated faster and more completely into America. They had improved depth of vocabulary, but they were no more likely to lose their accent, which we found very telling because it's very hard to lose your accent if you arrive in the country after the age of 12 or so. Um, it's really not a matter of investment in yourself. It's just a matter of the age um, in which you learn a new language and whether it's possible for you to actually say all of those phonemes. So we think that we found some pretty good evidence that um, the heightened assimilation that refugees experience is not because of government investment or some, um, government assistance, or at least it's not entirely for that reason, um, but instead it's because refugees know that they can't return home. And so they have a stronger incentive to invest in themselves in their new destination. So I'll conclude um, by um, saying that uh, we're just getting started on trying to use the data to understand how we can build bipartisan consensus towards immigration reform. Um, we started by just trying to understand what are the main sources of this partisan divide. Is it economics? Doesn't seem like it is. Instead, it seems like there's really a fundamental divide about the question, do immigrants hurt us by crime and threats, or can we help immigrants? Um, with words like family and uh, victims and persecution. Um, and once we did that classification, that gives us a sense of where our new research is headed. And so we're starting to try to understand uh, immigration and crime, as well as um, refugees and immigrants facing persecution. And so far, what we found is that concerns about the relationship between immigration and crime are unfounded. In fact, there's never been a time in US history when immigrants are more likely than the white US born to be incarcerated. And finally, protecting refugees can be a win-win in the sense that we can help refugees by 
uh, welcoming them into the country, but also it seems like refugees successfully assimilate both into US society and to the US economy. Um, so um, I'm very much looking forward to questions and thoughts uh, that you have about this work, um, both about the work that's in the book itself, um, which is thing, which is something that if you're interested, you can uh, read further in, in the book Streets of Gold, um, as well as some of the new research that we're doing now um, to try to um, understand uh, more about our partisan divides. Hey, thank you. I, I have to say that I just learned a lot, dispelled a lot of myths that I personally had, and uh, very surprised and very interesting. So I have one question so far from Harold Heft. It said on the 20 African country shown is Nigeria, and he wanted to know why that is. Um, so, okay, so it's a great question. Um, we have uh, 45 countries that we can um, individually identify in the modern data. Um, and only five of them are majority black, um, which included four Caribbean countries and one African country, Nigeria. Um, and the reason why is um, what we're looking at here are um, children who were born between 1980 and 1983. And then that's a group that includes my younger sister, for example, um, who are then followed into adulthood and they're captured in the labor market when they're between the ages of 35 and 40. Um, and so we need enough time to go by in order for the kids to really have um, some adult successes so that we can capture how well they're doing. Um, but the problem is if you go back to the early 80s, and the parent, their parents would have already had to move to the US before that. So we're really talking about immigrants who moved to the US in the late 70s. Um, the only country where there was a large enough number of families where the IRS felt comfortable giving out the data to us in this aggregate form, um, the only country from Africa was Nigeria. So that's really too bad. Um, but I do want to point out like a, a very interesting pattern that I didn't have time to go over given how much density of material I wanted to share, um, which is that the three countries uh, that are counter examples to what I said, so there's three countries where the kids were not moving up as fast as white US born, were Jamaica, Haiti, and Trinidad and Tobago. So three majority black Caribbean countries. But this is only true for sons. For daughters, the daughters of immigrants from those three countries are actually doing spectacularly well. Um, they're not at the very, very, very top of the upward mobility charts, but they are around at the two thirds mark. So um, whatever's going on um, in uh, the for Caribbean families seems like it's not only a race story, it's race interacted with gender in some interesting ways. Okay. Uh, I, from Edna Neumann, could you clarify how come on the tables about the rising of the second generation? I, I'm assuming you're seeing these also. Are you seeing them? Um, good question. Uh, let me take a look. I, I mean, I'll, I'm happy to read it. So could you clarify? I how did not see. I only see a few. I got a few direct messages, which I can read after this. But OK, I'll give you Edna. this one, and then you can read yours from Edna. Uh, could you clarify how come on the tables about the rising of the second generation, it indicates boys, and in the other graphs, it said males. Does it mean that girls and women are not in the data? OK, really great question, too. And I love how everyone is diving into all the details. Um, so in the historical data, I mentioned linking um, in individuals and their children across census waves. The way that we do that is we use someone's first name, last name, age, and state or country of birth to try to follow individuals over time. And it's very similar to how you might find a relative and you would see them in the 1900 census and then you pick them up again in 1910, you know that it's the same relative because you know your grandfather's name. I don't know these folks personally, but I'm a, a, again, I'm using the first and last name. So you can already start to see the problem with trying to follow women. Women change their name at marriage historically almost 100%. Um, and so we're not able to follow the daughters 
because we lose them when they get married. And so in order to be consistent with what I showed you today, I was showing you sons historically and then showing you also sons in the modern data. In the modern data, we can look at the daughters and we do. Um, but I have some very good news, which is that my graduate student here at Princeton has come up with a way to link women. Um, and that comes from the social security, um, initial social security application forms in the 1930s. So when the program began in 35 um, and you wanted to apply for a social security card, this was the first time social security cards existed, you would apply um, with a document that included both your maiden name and your married name. This was a really exciting discovery that's allowing us to link women. And the first thing that he's going to do once that data set is done is to produce a similar uh, table of dots for the daughters. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't seem like obvious that the daughters are necessarily going to rise at the same rate or with the same country patterns, because the way that the daughters were rising in for the 1910 girls um, would be through marriage rather than through their own labor market experiences. Why don't you read what you have and then I'll go back to mine. Great. Um, so let's see. So Sally um, said, one of the reasons people give for opposing immigration is that immigrants do not pay taxes. As an immigration lawyer, I know that the majority of immigrants do pay taxes, but there are those who do not. How does that affect your data for the modern era as your data is based on tax records? Okay, another excellent question. Um, so we are actually very lucky at, um, the fact that the IRS put together this data for the 1980 to 83 births. Um, those kids are very special when it comes to immigration history. In 1986, um, many of you probably remember the original amnesty program um, that was put together um, by President Reagan, the 1986 IRCA reform. At the time, there were around 3 million undocumented immigrants living in the country, and 2.5 and million of them were granted a pathway to citizenship. Um, and so while these kids may have originally, or some of them were originally the children of undocumented immigrants who may not have been paying taxes, who may not have had a social security number, by the time these kids were in teenager, could, um, their parents would have had access to a green card and citizenship. Um, so we're, we're guessing, although we don't know for sure, that we're capturing a very large share of um, the immigrants from that period. Now, we would not be able to use the same technique or the same trick today because today a quarter of immigrants are undocumented. They may not be filing taxes or they may not be filing under their own social security number. They may have um, a, someone else's social security number, a false one. Um, and so uh, this is an issue in terms of trying to use these kinds of methods to see what's going on with the more recent cohorts. Um, we have some other data sets that like allow us to, that are based on surveys, um, the general social survey, for example, but it's much smaller. So we can't break it down by country of origin. Um, we're talking about millions of kids underlying the dots that I showed you and only around 10,000 uh, kids in the general social survey. Do you have um, any more? I have a few also. I do. Let's see, I have a few more. Um, How were you able to separate Russians into Jews and non-Jews? Um, okay, so um, I have that and I have one more after that. Um, this, is a, this is a great question. Um, there's two different methods that we can use. One is that in some years, um, the census asked about mother tongue. And so the mother tongue for many Russian Jews is Yiddish. And so we can use that. Um, one problem there is that for other countries like German Jews, Yiddish is not as often, but sometimes it's the mother tongue, but not always, um, as well as other Eastern European countries. Um, so we have done a slightly fancier approach where we tried to pick out um, Jewish names based on the Yiddish speakers. So we see what names are very commonly found among Yiddish speakers. 
um, relative to the rest of the population, and then find people with those names, both first names and last names, um, and classify those folks as Jewish. Um, there will be some misclassifications there because there's always that person that you think, oh my gosh, that person has to be Jewish. And then it turns out that they're not. I mean, their name just sounds like, you know, really Jewish. And then it turns out that they're not. So there'll be some misclassifications there, but that's another approach that we can, that we use. Um, okay. And then my final question here is, um, does the crime series include detentions for immigration violations? Um, which would pump up the incarceration share for immigrants. Um, so we, we're guessing that it probably does. Um, if you are in immigration detention, it's likely that the census will record you as being in a correctional facility. Um, the time series, the pattern over time uh, for detention and deportation is really like a hockey stick. Um, so it has risen tremendously in the past 10, 20 years. So if, you, if that's a concern, we say, well, let's take a look at the data before the year 2000. And we still see a very similar pattern. Um, in that case, the detention rates were much lower and we're still seeing that there's a large gap um, with immigrants being much less likely to be incarcerated. In the recent years, we're guessing that the numbers for immigrants are pumped up a little bit due to this detention. And even then, we don't see that immigrants are more likely to be incarcerated. Okay, so from Helene Isaacs, your findings show that children of immigrants today continue to do well in our country. Does their being here legally versus illegally play into their success? How does access to education, jobs, et cetera, impact their success? Is that the same? Hold on, let me see. Is that the same or different today than it was during the Ellis Island period? Okay, a whole bunch of great questions. Um, so um, let's see. Um, let me start by um, saying that saying in the that historical, in historical data, data, we know everything there is to know about these households. Um, so we can really dive into what is the mechanism, like what is causing the success of the children of immigrants? Is it education or is it something else? And historically what we find is that the factor that can explain almost everything that we showed you in terms of the children of immigrants moving up the ladder faster than the children of the US born is geography. Immigrant families selected to live in the most dynamic parts of the country where there was rapid upward mobility for everyone. So what that meant in the past was, for example, immigrant families very rarely moved to the US South. This was during a time when the South was heavily agricultural, um, primarily cotton growing, and did not have high rates of upward mobility um, for anyone Black Americans, of course, but also white Americans. So at the time that 14% of the population was foreign born, like in 1910 or so, 2% of the Southern population was foreign born. So immigrants are already choosing to leave home. They're already choosing to go across the Atlantic. And once they get here, they don't move to the lagging and faltering regions. They move to the upwardly mobile regions. Even outside of the South, the same kind of pattern you can see, immigrants less likely to move to farm areas, rural areas, and even within cities, more likely to move to growing cities. Um, so what that meant was that if you were to compare two households living next door to each other, which we're able to do, given that we have you know, all this information about exactly where people live, the children of immigrants do not do any better than the child of the US born household living next door. The upward mobility patterns that we show you really has to do with where immigrants live versus where US born whites live on average. Another interesting, Another interesting thing, about, thing the about the past is that, is that children of immigrants earned more with less education than children of white US born parents. So I showed you these upward mobility graphs, these little dots that were telling us about the income level of these kids once they got to be around age 40. It didn't tell you anything about, did they go to high school? Did they finish 10th grade, 11th grade? 
So we, we have that information and we see that the children of US born parents get a little more education around a year more than the children of immigrants. Despite that, the children of immigrants were earning more. Um, so this is very typical in my grandfather's family. He his, was the seventh and his younger brother was the eighth and they both were able to go to city college in Chicago. And then my grandfather became a doctor and his younger brother became a lawyer. His six older siblings did not get to go to college, let alone did not get to finish high school. They had to leave school early to help the family. Um, but their family was living in Chicago, um, which was a very dynamic city in the 1920s, and they were able to find good jobs. Um, these days, we don't know as much about the explanations for why the children of immigrants are doing well, because we only have that very aggregated tax data. Um, it is under lock and key. There is one economist who has access to it. We hope we can um, work with him or in some way in partnership to, to answer the question for today. But from what little that we've been able to do with survey data, we see that geography plays much less of an important role today. It's still present, but it's not everything. So we think education, of course, is much more important these days. There was also this part of the question about illegal versus legal um, families and whether um, they have similar patterns of, of upward mobility. Um, and I think sort of related to Sally's or, or earlier question, I believe it was, um, we really have to think that what we're seeing here is the children of, of either legal immigrants or illegal immigrants who are able to regularize their status because of the 1986 IRCA. So we think of this as like what could be. This gives us a sense of what our society could look like if every family had access to documentation. From Sam Daly Harris, you were showing mostly positive comments on, on immigrants in recent years. Could you separate out positive comments on dreamers from positive or negative statements on immigrants generally? That's a great question. We have not done it, but I wrote it down and we will be able to do it. Um, we have separated out statements by the country of origin or ethnicity of the immigrants to see whether statements look different if we're talking about immigrants from Mexico or immigrants from China or immigrants from European countries. Um, and we see um, that there's no country today um, that is spoken about where the average speech is negative, but there's a wide dispersion so that speeches that mention, that mention Mexican Mex immigrants are really hugging the zero line. The average speech is basically neutral with some pro and some anti. Um, and the average speech about Chinese immigrants is substantially positive. So there's obviously a lot of differentiation um, about in speeches about different types of immigrants, but we haven't done that when it comes to dreamers or legal illegal or different other categories, H-1B visas or tech workers or doctors, or I mean, I think there's so much more that we can um, do with the richness of the data. It's a great idea. Um, uh, Naomi Richmond, the Trump administration proposed allowing more immigration from highly skilled or educated people in professions such as engineering and less immigration from unskilled or uneducated people. Does your research imply this is counterproductive because the second generation of these unskilled immigrants is likely to achieve economic success? Well, um, this is where there, I think there's a lot of scope for um, reasonable debate. Um, so Rehan Salam, who is the president of the Manhattan Institute, um, which is a conservative think tank in New York City, um, wrote a review of our book uh, in Foreign Policy Magazine. And he said, I like everything in the book. Very interesting, very well done, um, which was nice to hear uh, from someone who sometimes um, you might perceive as mildly anti-immigration. Um, but he said, you know, Abramitsky and Bustan say, based on the findings in their book, that it's OK for us to let in unskilled immigrants because they'll only be unskilled for one generation and the second generation will look sort of like the average. So we shouldn't stress. 
But I think, Rehan Salam said, all the more so we should let in only skilled immigrants because then the first generation looks good and the second generation looks good. So like, why should we wait? You know, if, if we have one generation that's doing kind of, you know, earning not so much and the second generation's okay, um, that means we have to delay our gratification by a generation. And that is a reasonable position, um, but we do have labor market needs that are beyond just um, doctors and engineers. Um, we have a number of jobs that uh, we can't outsource, we can't automate to robots um, that have to be do done by human beings. Um, so um, that can be some agricultural jobs where there's um, some crops that are picked by hand. Um, that can be human service jobs um, like child care and elder care. Um, that can be uh, many elements of construction and landscaping. That can be restaurant and service work. So if we want uh, that wide range of consumer products and we want that wide range in the, to be affordable to us, um, then our argument is that the first generation of immigrants um, will earn at low levels if they are coming in with less education and to engage in a number of those service positions, um, but that um, their children will not remain in a permanent underclass. So in some sense, we think we can you know, have our cake and eat it too. Um, and we worry about what will happen without, um, a, without workers um, who are um, interested in working in that wide range of positions. Um, so this is a potentially, you might consider a silly example, but to me, this really um, personalizes it and, and um, it allows me to think it through. When I was a kid, if you wanted to paint your nails, you painted your nails at home. I only saw in movies the idea that there would be some fancy spa where someone could go and get their nails painted in a, by a manicurist. These days, there are manicure salons, nail salons all over the country. Many have immigrants working in nail salons. And so we now have access to that consumer product and that consumer service um, at a price that many people consider affordable. So many people go get their nails done on a regular basis out in the market. Um, and so our view is that we can have access to those services and not have to worry about the second generation. Uh, from Jeff Savlov, have you or others studied being bilingual or multilingual as a significant factor for success regardless of immigration status? Jeff, that's a great question. We have not um, looked at that at all. Um, I do have a friend um, who has done quite a bit in the economics of, um, of bilingualism. Um, and so I will have to go ask him and look into it more myself, but um, I, we, we have not. So thank you. That, that sounds like a, a really interesting direction. Okay, from Michelle Albrin, turning the results on their head why do U.S. born whites do so much worse than U.S. born uh, from immigrants? Um, well, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, historically, um, what this, the, the role of geography in explaining why the children of immigrants do so well also helps us think through why the children of white U.S. born don't do so well. White U.S. born families are born into states all over the country. And as a child, you get endowed with this state. If you're endowed with New Jersey, you're lucky. If you're endowed with West Virginia, you might not be so lucky. And not everybody leaves home. Um, and so if you are born kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time, um, then that's gonna have a, um, a, a very significant effect on the shape of the rest of your life. Um, so one thing that we, we looked at was what happens to the, kids of white U.S. born families that do move out of their state of birth. Um, and that's something we can see in the census. The census has always asked for some reason, what is your state of birth? So even if they pick you up here in New Jersey, when they ask me, I say Massachusetts. So I would show up as a mover. I've left my home state. And then we can look at my kids. And what we find when we look at the children of internal movers is that they look a lot more like the children of immigrants. So really it has to do with being willing to move um, from a place that might not be the one that offers you the best opportunities. That could be Italy, 
or that could be West Virginia. Just with the caveat to say that we know a lot more about the past than we do about today, given the IRS data restrictions. Um, so I'm not sure whether um, the same th the same thing would be true today, but it does remind me quite a bit about uh, um, of Hillbilly Elegy and J.D. Vance, who now is famous for other reasons, um, being a recently um, elected senator from Ohio, um, and his book about um, growing up in Appalachia and um, the fact that he did move out of his region originally by um, joining the army and then um, he went uh, to Yale Law School and he says um, he's one of the only people from the, the town where he grew up who actually left the region. Um, so some of this sort of willingness or unwillingness to move could still be an important factor today. Okay, so it looks like I have uh, one more question from Debbie Brett. Looking at today's labor economy, we have a shortage of workers in most skill levels. Why isn't there more support for allowing greater immigration to deal with these shortages? Um, well, I don't know, um, but I have some interesting speculations about where some of the resistance to immigration comes from. Um, based on what just happened to us under COVID, right? So the 2020 and 2021 years were the lowest years of immigration um, in the past 30 years or so. And um, then associated with that, perhaps with some relationship there, um, we're seeing rising in rates of inflation. So I think that um, the interdependence uh, that we have um, in the labor market uh, on workers who, some of whom are US born, some of whom are born abroad is become more apparent to people. They didn't yet realize the relationship between immigrant workers um, available in their la local labor market and the prices that they would pay for services, particularly services like childcare. Um, the childcare costs going back after COVID um, were really astronomical. People were complaining, it's $40 an hour for me to try to get a nanny. Um, it was already high and now it's even higher. So I think people are starting to see that relationship in a way that they hadn't seen before. Um, but on the flip side, I'm starting to believe that some of the resistance to immigration um, comes from an association between immigrants and high housing prices. Economists have not talked about that hardly at all. They've talked about immigration and jobs um, and wages and unemployment to immigrants steal jobs. Um, but they haven't talked much about the fact that immigrants are people, people need a place to live. And when anyone moves into a, our region, if we're not building new housing, housing prices go up. And in fact, economists have searched high and low for empirical evidence that when immigrants arrive, wages fall, and they haven't found it. So that's always been surprising to economists. But every study, and there's not that many of them, but every study that have looked at do immigrant arrivals lead to higher housing prices have found that the answer is yes. So I think this relationship between immigrants and prices of all different kinds, both prices of services that we've come to expect and rely on like childcare, but also housing prices. Um, I'm, now that I see how people react to inflation, which I was very young at the time that we, of inflation, um, you know, in, in the 70s, so I don't have personal memory of it. Now that we've all gone through another episode of inflation and I see how much and how strongly and viscerally people react to prices, I think we're underemphasizing the importance of housing prices as part of people's resistance. Um, and you know we can do something about that because some people say, well, we should just, you know, cut off immigration. But we can actually do something else. We can we can think about building more housing. Um, so um, maybe the most recent episode uh, has has really changed people's mind and made it more obvious and salient to people um, that when we have a worker shortage, uh, that prices for some of the important services will rise. Okay, well, that's all the questions I have. I don't know if you have any. I would like to thank Leah for a, not only informative, but I have to say an extremely enlightening uh, 
talk, things that I, I'm seeing things very differently and I'm sure other people feel the same way. Thank you so much. It was really interesting. And I want to welcome, say I'm happy that everybody is here. Our next Great Mind Salon will be on December 6th. Um, information will be going out. It's going to be Matt Wasserman talking about his involvement with the organization Isles. So well, we're looking, yes. Can I just yeah. thank everyone as well for, for sure. being here and all of your excellent questions. Um, last time I was here three years ago giving a Great Mind Salon, I presented some new work as well and got all kinds of good questions from the community that allowed me to revise that paper. Um, and this time as well, I got I didn't change my like level or method of pr presentation uh, for you compared to when I'm at a university. Um, I, I kept everything as detailed and complicated as I would, and everyone was paying attention and great questions and paying attention to all the details. So I just want to to thank you for being so engaged um, with, with, with so much curiosity, um, and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And, and I can understand your students are probably extremely uh, well educated and enjoying your teaching as we did tonight. Thank you, so, Ellen. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to wish everybody a, a good evening, a good night and uh, pleasant dreams. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Moshe, for your help. See you next time. <laughs>